Good morning, church. How are we doing? Good? It's a good day to be alive. It's a good day uh, to be in church at all of our campuses. In fact, let's welcome them. Uh, Missouri City, we love you guys down in the, in the loop at West End. We love you guys. And I want to do this. Uh, I want to give at every campus, let's give the men at the Ramsey unit the most gracious round of applause. We love you, gentlemen. It is such an honor that we get to worship with them uh, week in and week out. I also want to say this to every campus. If you're visiting with us, um, I've already met multiple people at the Richmond campus that are visiting with us for the first time. We just want you to know how honored we are. Um, You're an answer to prayer. We pray that God would keep sending new people through these doors. And um, church can be an interesting thing when you're uh, new to a place. And so we just hope at every campus that you guys have such an incredible uh, experience here and that you feel seen and that you feel loved on because um, that's what we are here for. And so just thank you guys uh, for that. I, I am going to start this morning a little differently. We're going to have uh, some family time if that's okay. Uh, if you're visiting though, don't check out because you're going to hear some stuff about what's going on at the church. Uh, we had to uh, do something and make a decision um, because of what I call a good problem. As a leader, uh, you have plenty of problems anytime you're working within any kind of organization that has humans (laughs) involved in it. Um, So what I've always done as a value of mine is I said, hey, we're going to have plenty of problems that we have to work through. But what I'm going to be aware of and what I'm going to constantly fixate on is when we have good problems. And we have a good problem right now um, at our church because we need more seats especially as we're about to blink and fall is going to be here. And we know statistically and trend wise that a bunch of people, that's when they start uh, coming back. We need more seats uh, right now at Richmond. We need more seats down at uh, West End and we need more parking down at the West End campus. And so what we're doing is we are starting next week, adding a 1230 service to the Richmond campus. And we are adding a five o'clock service down at West End. Now, most city uh, don't sleep right right now because we haven't mentioned you because I was there a few weeks ago and it is trending in the direction where sooner than later we're going to have to go from two services to three services. What an incredibly good problem to have, is it not? And so here's my big ask, and this is a a really big deal. Some of you would love to serve, but because of your schedules and the way things work with your families, uh, you can't uh, serve on one of the teams at one of our campuses. But I want to offer you a serving opportunity that I think a lot of you can do, and this would be so helpful to us, is if you would consider uh, making the 1230 service your service. Here's why, uh, particularly the nine, uh, most weekends is getting uh, almost full to capacity, but at our 11 o'clock, and this is just how the trends work, at our 11 o'clock service, week after week, we have to send people out of here and into our overflow building, which I'm so grateful that we have. We usually send from one to 200 people over there. Uh, About a month ago at one service, we had that overflow room full, and we had to start putting chairs, excuse me, out in the lobby. And so if we could start to consider going to the 12th, 30 service, that would be the biggest blessing for us as a church because we really want newcomers to have the best possible experience that they can have. And so I'm just, I'm just asking you, uh, I would pay you if I had enough money to do it, to go to that service. But I feel like, man, there is going to be a blessing for you, for your family, uh, when you give up a little bit of convenience for the greater vision. Anytime we do that, we're showing Jesus. And so uh, that's my ask. Yeah, if, if any of you would consider it, Uh, please do that. That would be an answer uh, to prayer. Okay, now, switching. We are in week three, the final week of this series we've titled Game Changer. If you're new, uh, the reason we called it Game Changer is, as I said last week, there has been no bigger game changer in my life than when I started to let Jesus teach me how to pray. Not just Jesus, but a bunch of people when I was a new believer that had been praying a lot longer than me and that came around me and broke down all of the misconceptions and started talking to me about the power of it and the purpose of it. And so uh, one of the first things I wanted to do as one of your new pastors here was I was like, we're going to have a series about prayer and it's not just going to be a one-off and then we move on. We're going to be talking about, and not only talking, but more importantly, as a church, we are going to be practicing this beautiful thing that Jesus gave us uh, called prayer. And so I always like to say, hey, finish better than you started. Hey, go, I tell my kids this all the time. Hey, go out swinging. And so I'm going to give you guys uh, my heart and my passion today as we go back into uh, the words of Jesus and his God 
gospel as he's teaching a whole bunch of new believers. Everyone was a new believer back then, right? He was teaching them to pray. But I want to start with this uh, to get it going. I want to ask you a question. This isn't a rhetorical question. And so I apologize to all of our introverts at every campus ahead of time because I am going to ask you to turn to your neighbor and answer this question. But um, I realized, uh, you guys know this, I bring it up a lot. It's probably insecurity, but I turned 50 this year and I started to realize recently that I'm actually uh, getting old. And, and here's how. Um, I'm slowly becoming what I never wanted to become, which is the get off my lawn guy, right? Like things that I would have never thought about, things that would have never crossed my mind, they start to bother me now. And so I want to ask you the question, what are some of those things that you probably in the grand scheme of life, they're not a big deal at all, but what are a few of those things that are just like pet peeves, man? They just, for some reason, they get you. They just really bother you. So at every campus, look at your neighbor for a few seconds and tell them just one thing or two that just really bothers you these days. Hmm. Wow. This sounds like therapy, guys. What's going on? <laughs> okay, we are a bothered people. I like it. I'm not alone. This makes me, this makes me happy. Uh, this is cathartic for me. Uh, I wrote out this week, I just wrote out a list of a few things that, like I said, never used to drive me nuts. And now for some reason, as I'm becoming old and the get off my lawn guy, it just bothers me. Uh, first and foremost, this is, I think, a universal one, so I'll start with it. Uh, I'm a lead foot, right? And so if you're like me, uh, you know what I'm about to say. If you drive slow, Jesus loves you. I love you. We love you. Get over. Can I get an amen? Thank you. We love you. Jesus loves you. Died for you. But man, get over in that slow lane, please. This one's huge for me. It's the justice side of me coming out. Anytime someone skips in line, this has bothered me my whole life. But now, now it's bothered me to the point where my grumpy old self will say something, right? Like, no, we've paid prices to be in this line. Don't you dare try and skip in line. Another one is this. Oh, this, is, this one's growing on me big time. If you're at Target or you're at Walmart or whatever, and you come out to car and you put your groceries up, put your cart back where it goes. And if you do not, this grumpy 50-year-old is going to come and put that cart right behind your car so you can't back out <laughs> until it's taken care of. I'm done with it. This is just, this is once a year, but this, this is starting to really get me. This is how I know I'm getting old. Uh, teenagers, when they knock on my door on Halloween and they don't have costumes on. <laughs> and then they don't say trick or treat either. Because they're teenagers, right? They knock on the door like, hey. And I'm like, What? Oh, we just wanted to get some candy. And I'm like, well, you're going to have to go home and put a costume on then first. And then you're going to come back. And when you come back, you're going to say trick or treat, man. I want you to earn that Snickers, son. <laughs> this is a longstanding tradition. I'm not having that. I used to just give them candy, but now I'm like, nope, you're going to pay a price for this. Go put your costume on. Oh, this is going to bless a lot of you parents with kids right now. Uh, the, the cost of kids sports anymore. Yeah, thank you. Right now we're having church. It's getting out of control. If you're a seven-year-old kid, do you really know to, need to go to Phoenix for a wood bat baseball tournament? No. Write this down. No one's going pro. Parents, write this down. Your kids aren't going pro. Do the percentages, right? Like, just enjoy it. But it is getting out of control. And I end with this one because this one gets me the worst. Uh, when you have loud phone talkers in public. Yeah, thank you especially in the airport. You guys know before this, I was traveling for the last five years. I was traveling as a preacher and an evangelist. So I was in an airport every week and I cannot tell you how many times this just started to, in fact, about a month ago, I was on a plane and the guy behind us before we took off was literally having his business meeting on his phone and me and the person next to me, we weren't talking, but we were just looking at each other like, you've got to be kidding me. Then at one point, he gets a call on the other line. He goes, hey, guys, just give me one second. I've got a call on the other line. And I looked at the person next to me. I said, I hope it's self-awareness calling. I really do. Because <laughs> this guy is out of... Anyways, we have to move on, and we have to bathe ourselves now in the Bible after that. But that just... I feel a weight lifted off me. I feel like I can preach now with integrity. But the reason I set today up with that is because I'm about to tell you something that probably many of you haven't 
probably thought of a whole lot. And it's this, and it's super counterintuitive, but it is 100% true. And we are going to see that all throughout the gospel today. And it is this. And I love this. This is good news. You serve a God that is not a get off my lawn God. You serve a God, and we're going to see it, that says, I love to be bothered by my kids. Right? That phrase we use, especially if you're really self-aware, is like, hey, I just don't, I don't want to be a bother. We are going to see today that God says, no, 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 no. I really want you bothering me. Nothing makes me happier than when you keep coming to me and you do it full of faith and you do it full of consistency and you do it full of passion. I love to be bothered. So don't take my word for it. We're going to go to the gospel of Luke. Jesus is, again, being asked about how to pray because I said it before and I'll say it again. Everyone back then was a new believer. Everyone back then was new to the type of praying that Jesus brought to the table. They were just used to the Jewish system, which was beautiful and amazing, right? Temple prayers where they said them together, which is a beautiful thing. And they repeated the same things every week, but then they started to see Jesus who would get alone and he would just have these very authentic and very natural conversations with the father. And then they watched what came from that. And they said, hey, we wanna be involved in that as well. Teach us to pray. And so it says this, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, okay, so when you pray, say, and he gives a little uh, bit of a cut down edited version of the full Lord's prayer. He says, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, and now he's about to teach, right? Last week we saw on the front end of that prayer, he talked about motive. And I said last week, motive matters in prayer way more than the method does. The Lord's prayer is this divinely inspired, beautiful method, but no method ever matters because it's just a means to an end, right? If your heart isn't authentic, if your heart isn't in a real uh, a place. So we talked about that, but now he's going to give this like motivation of like faith. Like, I want you to bother me. Jesus said to them, and he, he makes up a story to prove a point. He says, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight. This is already getting bad, right? Friend, lend me, th- not one. I want you, Jesus is up to something when he's saying three loaves. Not one, not two, not three, and here's why. Because in that culture, first century Judea, they were highly oppressed, and it was very hard to put meals on the table for the average person. So not only, think about this, not only is this person shameless and audacious enough to come to him at midnight, but he asked for not one, not two, but what? Give me three loaves of bread, and here's why. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and here's how you knew they had hard times back then. They said, and I have no food to offer him. Goes on to say, and suppose the one inside answers what? Don't bother me, right? That would be all of our answer. It's midnight. Are you an idiot? Why would you do this? And you want three loaves of breath? Bread? Breath? Bread? Says, do not bother me. There's the word. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed, I can't get up and give you anything. And then Jesus says this in this story. He says, I tell you, in other words, this is 100% the truth. Even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, yet because of your what? I love this phrase. I've adopted this phrase into my prayer life and it has been a game changer. It holds me accountable to the type of faith and boldness that we are to bring to our prayer lives. Yet because of his shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. And Jesus is trying to tell them this. He says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. He says, for everyone who asks, receives doesn't say how, he doesn't say when, in what kind of time frame, but he says, when you ask, God will at some point have you receive exactly what he wants for you. The one who seeks always over time finds, and to the one who knocks, Jesus says, the door is always open for you, even at midnight, when you don't need one, you don't need two, but you need three loaves of bread. I have tried to incorporate, and this is what I want us this weekend at every campus to really start thinking about, is how shameless am I when I come to God in prayer? Or are my prayers marked by shame? 
Does the quality of my faith when I come to God for anything depend on how I'm feeling about myself that day? Because that's what Jesus is trying to break down because Jesus doesn't do shame. That's not his business, right? In the Garden of Eden, they were naked and felt no what before sin. Shame is a result of sin and sin causes us to lose our confidence when we come to God. And the beautiful thing that we'll keep seeing today is that Jesus came to restore that confidence back to us, not because of our own personal awesomeness, not because we live every day without sinning and deserve to come to God, but because Jesus was the sinless savior, the lamb, like we sang earlier today, that was slain for us in our place so we could exactly do what we need to do when we least feel like it, but most need it, which was approach the throne of grace to receive mercy in our time of need and to do it with boldness. I have uh, four kids and my youngest son, his name is Cruz. He's nine years old. And by far out of our four kids, he is the one that most naturally has, I think it's a younger sibling thing. He has the most shameless audacity of anyone in our family. So much so that uh, my two older kids, particularly, they will send him daily, sometimes multiple times a day on missions to come to me or their mother for him to ask something that they actually want, but are too scared to ask because they know it's an audacious ask. I can't tell you how many times my my nine-year-old go, hey, I was just really wondering if we could maybe have McDonald's this week one night for dinner. And I'm like, Jane sent you here to ask that, right? My daughter loves McDonald's, right? Like she, and he's like, yeah. But he just comes every time. And even when it's for him, he doesn't think about the implications. It never crosses his nine-year-old mind if he deserves it or not, or if he's worthy or not, or if, if, if he's had a good week or not. He doesn't. He just says, I need something. I think my parents are the people that uh, have the ability to give that to me. So I'm just shamelessly and audaciously going to go ask them. You know what my older kids are doing when they send my younger son? They're doing something that we as the church are called to do in prayer borrow faith from each other. Like, I don't, I don't have the faith for that, but I desperately need that. But I've seen your walk with God. And you know what? I do know right now you have the faith for that. And this is why Jesus says where, where two or three agree as touching any one thing, it shall be done. Jesus is saying, Hey, there's times when you need a spotter in life. There's times when you need so many things to happen for you uh, from God on behalf of God, but, but your faith tank is low right now. This is why we do community together. This is why we, we do not just personal prayer like we talked about last week, but this is also why we do corporate prayer that I want to talk about this week together is because we have been called to borrow faith from each other to fight not just our own battles, but help each other fight each other's battles. So in Luke, we just read Luke 11. In Luke chapter 18, this is such an important theme that Jesus doubled down. He's gonna give us the exact same principles, but this is so important to him that he decided to make up another parable, another story to tell us, to like egg us on, to have this shameless audacity in our prayers. It says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. My life in many seasons of my walk with God, like I'm sure many of yours, has been marked by moments where I gave up in prayer. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes where where I don't always pray. I know it's a good thing. I know I I, want to always do it. I want to pray continually like the word of God tells me, but that's easier said than done. But listen to how important that that consistency is. I, I guess what Jesus is saying is how powerful and moving and important is prayer when Jesus literally makes up story after story to teach us to always pray and never give up. He goes on to say this. He said in a certain town, and here's where he makes up a story to prove a point, there was a judge. Now listen to the character in the heart of this judge. It's the exact opposite of the heart of God. He says it was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time, the judge refused. But finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God, and even though I don't care what people think, yet because this widow keeps, what's the word, bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. 
so that she won't eventually come and attack me, which I just had a funny moment reading that this week where I'm like, this dude's scared of the widow attacking him. I want to know this lady, boss lady. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? And Jesus says this, he says, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. And then Jesus tries to start egging us on. And I love this. He's like, he's like pushing us towards more faith, pushing us towards always praying and not giving up. He says, however, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on this earth? And so before we baptize a bunch of people this morning in a beautiful way, I just want to give really quickly three what I think are universal reasons that we quit praying. Three universal reasons why we're so tempted to give up and for our prayer life to become dry. And as we talked about last week, sometimes non-existence. And these three ones aren't just ideas that I read in a book. These are three that I've drawn from my own personal prayer experience. These are the three, and we could talk about more, but I picked the three what I think are most universal reasons that we struggle to always pray and not give up. And the first one to me is the most universal. And it's just this, you just feel unworthy right? I think so much of our confidence before God, because this is how we interact with everybody else in this world, we're used to it, uh, completely depends on how our performance has been lately. Any of you ever feel that besides me? I I find myself like the, the type of boldness I have or do not have in my prayer time with God, oftentimes, unfortunately, is completely predicated upon how I've been that week. Am I super spiritual guy that week? Or have I been in the slums with my sin and my struggles? addictions, temptations, right? How, how, how was the weekend, right? Well, well, I was at the club and so I skipped church. So I'm going to take two weeks off from talking to God to pay some penance and punish. I'm going to put myself in a grounding and then eventually I'll go back and talk to God when I think he's less mad at me. And the problem with that is prayer was precisely given, not just for the super spiritual people that just love Jesus so much and perform so beautifully, prayer was given to us precisely knowing that we would have to constantly, in what feels like unworthiness, boldly approach the throne of grace, right? And let me ask you this, what could be more shameless and more audacious for somebody who knows according to their performance or behavior that they are unworthy to speak and ask anything of a holy God, what would be more shameless and audacious than to still choose to bother him even though you 100% feel like you don't deserve his ear? Look, if we read the scripture right, the Bible says repeatedly, no one is righteous, no, not one. That doesn't mean that you're not a good person. That doesn't mean that you don't do nice things. That doesn't mean that you're not trying really hard. It simply means that God's original standard has never changed and never will. And his standard has always been perfected holiness, complete sinlessness, and total righteousness. And this is why we preach the gospel. This is why we don't preach ourselves. This is why we continually come and lift up the name of Jesus is because our only hope for confidence and worthiness and righteousness and holiness is when we by faith continually put our faith in the innocent and divine shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's his blood in our place that makes you righteous. It's his blood on the cross that makes you worthy on your worst day to boldly come in to the throne of grace and ask for mercy in your time of need. It's not your performance that gives you a right to bother God. It is your position that gives you the right to bother God. And we are told over and over in the scriptures that your position, when you by faith, when you by belief, put your trust that Jesus was God in the flesh, that Jesus lived a sinless life, that he was crucified, he died, he was buried, and that he conquered death by being resurrected. When you put your heart and your words to that kind of faith, you instantaneously have a position that always qualifies you to shamelessly and audaciously come to God, not on your best days, but especially on your worst days when you most need him to work on your behalf, to change your heart, to change your mind. We've been given this beautiful gift called repentance. We are not worthy, none of us 
on our best day of spiritual living. The prophet Isaiah said, on your best day, it's still like filthy rags compared to God's original intent that he had for us. And so when you come to Jesus, you come with my nine-year-old's faith, right? You cannot enter. You cannot embrace the kingdom of God unless you become like a child. You have to, when you come to God, you can, yes, we want to confess our sins. I do that every day. You repent of those sins and ask to change your ways. But in that, you come with a holy boldness because you are a son and a daughter of a king simply because of your belief and faith in Jesus, not your performance. And so I want to challenge you when you feel most unworthy to enter the presence of God, you come in boldly and you remind yourself of who you are in Christ Jesus because of what he has done for you. He calls you holy. He calls you blameless. You are adopted into the kingdom of God with the full rights. You are the co-heir with Christ. The Bible says you sit with him today, right now in the heavenly realms. You get a place of authority, not because you've earned it or deserved it, but because Jesus paid the final punishment to bring us all back to a place. The Bible says the minute Jesus breathed his last, that veil in the temple that represented separation between God and us, it was ripped in half and it was God saying, it's time to start bothering me again. You have been brought back to righteousness and holiness through my son's sacrifice on the cross. We don't have time to waste by you playing small and feeling all kinds of shame when you come into prayer. No, you come in audaciously. It's audacious to ask for forgiveness. It's audacious to ask God to remove shame. It's audacious. God's the God of not one, two, but ask me for three loaves at midnight. You're never, uh, you're never getting me at a bad time, God says in that story. You're never asking for too much, God says. Doesn't mean we know what his sovereign, good, kind answer is always going to be, but God says, I want you to bring that kind of faith to me. The second is this. So number one, we feel unworthy. Number two, this is a big one, just good old fashioned results fatigue. I think this will strike a chord at all our campuses because I've heard a bunch of your stories and a bunch of you have been praying for a a long time for that prodigal child to come home. And right now on paper, it doesn't even look like they're close to wanting to come home. And you're getting tired of bringing it up to God and you're assuming God's tired of hearing about it. You're stuck to maybe thinking you're doing something wrong or you're praying wrong or that your unworthiness has blocked God's ear from you. And that could not be farther from the truth. The book of Galatians says, hey, do not grow weary in doing well. For at the right time, and that right time is not up to us, but at the right time, you will reap a harvest if you just don't give up. And some of you, you've done that right now, and I have done that many times. And this is not a, a message of guilt or sh- I don't, I don't do that. This is a message of, of saying, even when the prayers aren't being answered in the way or the time frame that you would like, let's go back to last week. What you have to lean into and build your faith on is every time you keep bringing these prayers and requests to God, he is forming something in you. He is growing your character. He is cultivating more and more integrity. He is in prayer bringing out more and more of the realest, most authentic you that he originally designed before this dumb thing called sin got in the way. Some of you, you have results fatigue and you've just given up. And can I just say some good news today? God's not mad at you. God's not disappointed in you. He understands our weakness. And if I read the scriptures right, the beauty of the kingdom of God, which is different than this world, it says, actually, it's in your weakness where my power is made perfect. So if you're tired, you got results fatigue, bring that to God. Bring that weakness to God. God's like, okay, that's when I can do some powerful things. You're at the end of your rope. He says, my grace will be sufficient for you in your fatigue. But here's what I know. A great mentor taught me this. When fatigue walks in, faith usually walks out. Sometimes we're just tired and we're frustrated. We're tired of hearing ourselves pray that same prayer and request over and over. And Jesus is trying to teach us, hey, no, 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 no. Keep doing it. I know it gets frustrating and I know you don't fully on this side of heaven because my, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your ways. I know you don't fully understand what I'm up to, but you've got to remind yourself every time you keep bringing this to me, you are growing. And I am doing, by the way, a thousand things under the surface of that situation that looks like it hasn't moved an inch. I am doing a thousand sovereign things that you'll never be able to recognize. I just need you to trust me. Third and finally, and this is is maybe the most personal one, 
And again, this has not only happened in my life, but as a pastor, I hear story after story after story. It's simply this in prayer. This is one of the great prayer killers. It's disappointment with God. Let's get real for a moment, right? These are the prayers where what you were putting all your faith towards, you actually got the exact opposite answer that you were believing for. And it rocked your world. It rocked your faith. You started questioning the the power and idea about this thing called prayer. You start to question yourself because you're going, what? You start to, in really difficult, horrible situations where the prayer didn't go the way you thought. I'm talking about the diagnosis, the stage four. You start rising up and praying for that spouse of yours that just got the diagnosis and you're praying and your family's believing and all your friendship circles believing and the church is praying for them and believing. You're doing what the scripture tells you to do and you're believing in Jesus of Nazareth, this great healer. And then all of a sudden the, the, the answer was, oh, they're going to be healed, but it's not going to be on this side of eternity. That can rock someone's faith. And many of you at every campus, hear me, that's your story right now. And I just know that I know that I know that the God we serve does not take that situation lightly. I know he understands maybe why you quit praying, maybe why you started giving up in your personal intimacy with him was because you're hurt. Maybe cynical, frustrated. You're starting to question the character and the goodness of God. And here's the ironic thing, church, is that's when you most need to bring those things to God. Pastor Clay talked about it in week one, such a great message. He, the Psalms give us permission to come to God with our frustration, with God, right? We always say this, it almost feels too small to say this, but he's a big boy, right? Sorry, God, you're much more than that, right? But you guys know what I'm saying, right? Like, like if anyone can handle the greatest depths of our hurt and pain and discouragement and frustration, even with him, It's him going, listen, I get it, but please, as your father, come talk to me. Let's work this out together. Let's not use third parties. Let's not separate from each other. Nothing good ever comes from that. Let's work this out together, past disappointment from God. And I I had a story I was going to tell you about what what happened to me, but we we want to baptize. That's why we're here today. So I'm going to land this plane uh, right now. We are going to do this as a church. I, I, some of you know this because you were at like the town hall meetings as members and I got to talk to you about this. Some of you haven't heard the full extent of my heart, but um, when I was being interviewed for the job, I had so many interviews. It was a lot. And uh, that's a good thing, but it was a lot. But my first set of interviews over Zoom was with the board here. And the first question I got was from an incredible human being and all the board members on our board are super successful and they're out in the corporate world and they're just crushing it at all fronts. Uh, I didn't graduate college and so I literally prepared myself ahead of time. I'm like, Chad, you're not gonna get this job, um, <laughs> but you have, to, you have to be yourself. You owe it to them and you owe it to yourself. You have to be your truest self when you talk to them. So don't give answers to try and win over a job. Just give answers that are from your heart. And the first question I got was, okay, Chad, first 90 days, you're our leader now. What are you going to do? And I was trying to instantly go into like, say what they want to hear. They're, they're in corporations. They have all this mapped out. And I didn't. And so I finally said, no, 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 you be yourself. And I said, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> and I literally said, well, you just lost the job, but you stayed true to yourself. Good job. <laughs> take the win before you take a big loss here. But, and I said, but I can tell you this, I'm going to pray a whole lot those first 90 days because this is a big job and these people deserve redemption. These people deserve something really healing and beautiful right now. And I would love to participate with the rest of the staff in helping to bring that to this incredible church that just went through a really uh, difficult year. So I'm gonna gonna pray a whole lot. And the reason is, is because my whole life's been built on it. I don't know how else I could thrive. A kid like me, my lack of skill set, my lack of all of the things that sometimes this job would require. I was very honest with them about that. But I said, we are going to pray. I'm gonna pray, but we are gonna pray as a church because I've never known what else to do and I do not believe there is anything more important than we start coming together again and and borrowing each other's faith for miracles from God. I believe that with all of my heart. Every ounce of conviction. 
all of my confidence, all of my trust to do my job best is not only when I'm praying to God and not giving up, but when we are starting to do it together as a church. And this isn't to say you haven't in the past. This is just me simply saying this is one thing we are going to talk about and one thing we are actually not just talking about, but practicing. The book of James says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. The church literally got founded on a, okay, Jesus' last statements to them, go pray and go wait. And then when it's time, I'll start the movement. That's the pattern. You pray and you wait for power from the Holy Spirit. And then we will watch not just fun church happen. We'll start to watch miracles happen. It's nice to have a good church with amenities and good systems in place. But honestly, I can get that almost anywhere in a capitalistic world. Do you know what I want to come to church for? I want to see miracles. I want to see the blessing of God starting to permeate this place in ways that we haven't even believed for yet. And so this Thursday night, and I end with this, this is so important. Uh, I, I know some of you with schedule and work, this isn't possible. But we are going to have one of the first of many prayer and worship nights. It's going to look different than the Sunday morning experience. We will worship. We will take communion together. And then we are going to just start doing what the Bible asks us to do and trust God that he blesses his children when they obey. We are going to pray for healing. We are going to pray for miracles. We are going to pray together for marriages. We're going to pray together for our financial situations. We are going to pray together uh, for the state of culture and the state of our country. We're going to pray together for everything under the sun that needs to be prayed for. I'm telling you, if you can at all make it to this Thursday night service, you will not regret it. We've invited, this is cool, we've invited the Missouri City campus to be with us uh, for at least the first one because sometimes we forget that we're one church but in three different places, four, four different places, uh, Ramsey unit, right? Like, and we want the Missouri City, we're not gonna ask those inside the loopers to drive that far. We know better than that, but we got you because here's what's happening. On August 11th, West End, uh, we're coming down to you guys. And we're going to do the same thing on your Sunday night, 5 p.m. service in lieu of the message and all that. We are going to come and we are going to have a night of prayer and worship. And I cannot wait to be with you guys. So this Thursday in this building, get here early so that you get a seat. We are going to have one of many prayer and worship nights. Any of you think you might come? Just give me some confidence here. Anybody? Don't lie. If you can't make it, it's all good. Yeah, we're going to have a really good and incredible time. So let me pray. And then I would love for as many of you as possible as church family to stick around and watch these amazing people be baptized. Jesus, I pray that you'd bless every single person in this room. God, that you would keep them in the grip of your grace, that you would cause your face to shine upon them, that you would be radically gracious to us. Turn your countenance towards us, God, and may every single one of us at every campus walk out of these doors with a peace that passes understanding that guards our hearts and guards our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We love you guys. See you next week.